Well, welcome to the George Washington University. Uh, our campus here, uh, which is called the Virginia Science and Technology Campus, has been here for over two decades. And you're in one of the buildings that we have on this campus. Uh, as you were entering uh, the, the road uh, to, to the campus, you probably saw three or four other buildings that belong to us. And we are proud to have uh, a great deal of research in science and technology going, here, going on here and, and some educational programs. Uh, let me welcome you on behalf of the George Washington University, Northern Virginia Technology Council, and ATTAIN. And uh, this morning's symposium is about the future of our region as a global center for big data. My name is Ali Eskandarian, and I am the dean of the George Washington University's Virginia Science and Technology Campus. Northern Virginia Technology Council President and CEO Bobby Kilberg is sorry that she couldn't be here with you and, uh, and for this particular uh, release of the report. Uh, this is a very important research. She cared co uh, quite a bit about it. Uh, she's in Colorado, just in case you want to know, for the, <laughs> for the bris of her latest grandson, which is taking place this morning. So uh, it's a very happy occasion, uh, except for one, one person there. So we're here, as I said, for the release of a report conducted by Chamura Economics and Analytics highlighting the depth and breadth of big data experience, expertise, and assets of our region. The event also features two panels of technology, industry, and academic leaders who will discuss the challenges and opportunities for big data technologies, big data applications, and analysis, and will explore efforts to grow the talent pool to power the region's big data related businesses. So before we begin our program, I'd like to thank the sponsor of this morning's program. Uh, first of all, the research partners, as I said, were the George Washington University, Virginia Science Technology, ATTAIN, um, and of course, Northern Virginia Technology Campus, I mean, no, Council. Uh, the pr premier sponsor is ATTAIN. The kickoff sponsors are IBM and SAP. The event sponsors are CapTech, I'm going to get this wrong, but Volganau School of Engineering is George Mason University. So we're happy to have George Mason with us. Media sponsors is Synoptis, and of course the location sponsor, as you have figured out by now, is GW. We'd also like to recognize a few special guests who are with us today, and uh, we're proud to have them with us. Um, I will start with the I will start with the former Secretary of Education, Laura Farnash, who has been a great friend of, of, the, uh, of the Commonwealth as well as GW. Uh, we have Virginia Delegate, Tag Greeson. Uh, we have Senator Jennifer Wexton. And we have Loudoun County Supervisor, Suzanne Volpe, who is also a great friend of ours, and I'm happy to have them here. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, you uh, to listen to the welcoming remarks by our 16th president. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce President Steve Knapp. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Dean Iskandarian. It's a, it is really great to be here for this, uh, what I think is really a momentous uh, event for not only for the George Washington University and for the many partnering institutions that you heard uh, the dean refer to, but also for the uh, rapidly growing economy of the Commonwealth of Virginia and, of course, uh, Loudoun County, our home county here for our campus in, uh, that, we, that we call our, our uh, science technology campus and that has been growing, as the, as the dean said, for now a little more than 20 years. And I'm really delighted to welcome you to the campus and, uh, and to join the dean in uh, greeting uh, Senator Wexton, Delegate Greeson, Supervisor Suzanne Volpe is also with us here, and, uh, and former Virginia Secretary of Education, Laura Fornash. I want to thank uh, uh, Chris and Greg for all the work that they've done to help us uh, move to this, uh, this very important moment, I think. Now, we want to be a part, and I've, I've actually been saying this uh, ever since I, actually before I was officially on board as president, because I actually made my first visit to Loudoun County and to this campus before I was even officially uh, on board as president of the university. We want to be an essential part of this region's emergence as an increasingly powerful innovation-based economy. 
and, uh, and George Washington has been part of Loudoun County, as, as we said, for more than 20 years, and now has uh, 20 degree and certificate programs and 17 research laboratories located on our campus, which is also the home to our School of Nursing that was established here in 2010. And the newest addition to our campus, uh, which I hope you may at some point have an opportunity to tour, is our Conservation Center, which is uh, a complement to the museum we're building uh, that will open next fall on our Foggy Bottom campus. Uh, and it's a state-of-the-art uh, conservation and storage uh, facility for the textile museum and the other holdings of the university's museum uh, in, in the District of Columbia. Uh, but it's one of the, it's the newest of, of the many facilities we're building out here, which I think will have a, a broad interest for the community and for the development of economic opportunities here in Loudoun County. Um, last year when I spoke to the Loudoun County Chamber of Commerce about our efforts to make big data a central focus of our research here, what I emphasized was that we are selecting this because we think it's going to be an economic driver for this region and a, a source of innovation for our industrial partners. And I think one of the things that's a hallmark of our Loudoun County, of our Loudoun County campus is that we are developing our activities here very much with an eye toward partnering with uh, the emerging industries in the region. Uh, we've put big data and life science together in this initial uh, phase of our big data investments. And we've done that by establishing two different uh, data centers. To, to, by the way, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm saying data. I, this morning I've heard a lot of people saying data. At some, point, at some point we should probably take a vote so we can settle that once and for all, whether it's data and da or data. But we've got those uh, centers here. Um, and, and the first of those is the Computational Biology Institute led by Keith Crandall. Uh, Dr. Crandall will be one of the speakers later in the program. He's a scientist we were very fortunate to bring to the university uh, just a couple years ago and uh, came to us from, from Utah, but is a real leader in the field of computational biology. And uh, we've added new computing capacity to this campus, complementing what we already had here in the form of our high performance computing laboratory that has been located on the campus since 2008. Last uh, summer, we created an additional big data initiative focused on medical genomics, which is the basis for what's called personalized medicine. This is using the genetic information about each of us and also about the uh, diseases that, uh, that attack us to help determine what the appropriate medical treatment would be for a particular disease. It turns out that uh, if you have a, uh, uh, you know, if you have the misfortune of being struck with a cancer, for instance, the genetic uh, makeup of your body and of the cancer that happens to be the one that's, that's attacking you uh, has a tremendous uh, impact on the, the appropriate choice of the medicine that will work in your particular case. So that if we're successful in this uh, activity, which is becoming a national uh, effort to develop what's called personalized medicine, sometimes um, uh, called precision medicine. Uh, the idea is that we'll no longer have to suffer through the trial and error of attempting to use different uh, chemothera uh, chemotherapy agents to, uh, to affect your cancer, but we'll be able to zero in on what will work the first time around. And so this, if it, if it succeeds, will be a tremendous, uh, I think, benefit in terms of reduction of suffering, but also reduction of the cost of medical care. So, so that's two centers so far, computational biology and genomics, and we're planning this fall to add a third big data initiative that will be focused on physics and engineering. When you add up the investments that the George Washington University is making in these centers over the next uh, five years, it amounts to about $20 million of investment in uh, the science that we are doing, that our faculty and students are engaged in, and of course that's a $20 million investment also in economic opportunity here in Loudoun County and in the Commonwealth of Virginia. So we're looking forward to hearing today's presentation on the challenges and opportunities posed by big data technologies. Thank you all for being here, and I think you'll find this a very informative uh, and, uh, I, and I hope encouraging sign of innovation as it is unfolding in the Commonwealth and here in Loudoun County. Thank you. Thank you, President Knapp. Um, I think I, 
I missed one of our special guests, so I would like to apologize and, and mention that the Virginia Deputy Sec Secretary of Technology, Tony Fung, is here with us as well. So now I would like to introduce to you my co-sponsor and, and, and a good friend, at least until today. <laughs> Greg Baroni, who's chairman and CEO of Attain, and is a, a co-sponsor of this research and a, and a real advocate for, the, for this industry in, in Northern Virginia. So, Greg. Right. Well, thank you, Ali. I, I hope I can continue his friendship, especially you know, with, after hearing all the opportunities uh, about uh, the investment being made in this region from Dr. Knapp. I thought, wow, this would be a great opportunity to invest some of Attain's resources and helping create this research park that I think might be possible around here. So that will strengthen. But our I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. I'm I'm delighted to be here as one of the co-sponsors of this effort here. Um, but I also want to uh, express some additional thanks uh, to the companies and the individuals that participated in NVTC's Big Data Task Force over the past year, particularly its uh, co-chairs and. I'm not sure, I, I know one couldn't be here, which was Jen Morgan from SAP, uh, but Ann Altman, who will actually be chairing a panel that follows uh, the presentation by Chris, uh, Dr. Tremura. Um, so uh, the other thing is, if any of the uh, task, more, uh, task Force members, uh, and, and uh, would they please stand, or anybody who participated in the uh, focus group meetings that we had with, for creating the survey, I know Dr. Dr. Darren, there we go, here we go, a couple of them, thank you. Doug Beck, thank you. All right, so let me just thank them because this is terrific. Um, I, I wanted to acknowledge them because these folks really helped spur uh, the report that you're, we're about to share with you. It was the, the industry, uh, the academic, and the research leaders, uh, and in particular, the NVTC membership that really saw this region as having the potential of having a unique set of, of resources, knowledge, and expertise that uh, would strengthen uh, the leadership position of big data and analytics uh, market here. And, and what we say that this region is, is what we're dubbing now as the nation's data capital. Um, and you know, in order to secure this region's, if you will, uh, position as the global mecca for ba big data. There are several, if you will, uh, goals that need to be achieved in order to, to realize this, uh, this vision here. And one is the stimulation of the big data and analytics driven economic development, which you heard Dr. Knapp kind of reference what's being done here in Loudoun County. The second is demonstrating to others the value of investing or, and or expanding into this particular region. And if you look at venture capital and private equity, uh, they may have been setting, sitting on the sidelines, but this is a ripe opportunity for them. Uh, enhancing this region's uh, capacity to further develop uh, the big data and analytics workforce of the future, both now and in the future, and then harnessing the potential of big data and analytics to create value. And with the work that Dr. Crandall and others will be doing in this region, you'll see that the possibility for getting that done is very real uh, and in the near future. Well, with this ambitious agenda, NVT engaged Chermira Economics and Analytics to conduct this research that, as a first step, would catalog this region's expertise, its knowledge, and the experience that we have in the field of big data and analytics. And the resulting report that we are calling now the Big Data and Analytics uh, Report in Northern Virginia and, and the Potomac region it concludes that this region is, in fact, the leader in this market uh, with several distinct competitive advantages. And, and now, you know, with having, been, with having such a rich asset base, uh, now we're going to be talking about, well, how do we really drive into each of these areas of opportunity? Now, that said, this region isn't without its competitive threats and, and challenges, uh, particularly in this growing field. And among them, uh, and by the way, these, these challenges aren't unique to this area. They're certainly um, true for the nation and around the globe. But the issues of security, of privacy, of data integrity, 
and of, of satisfying the surging demand for this, this need for talent. Uh, but we'll also get to each of those uh, in, the, in the upcoming panels, and I know two panels in particular will be addressing those. In just a few moments, you'll hear the report from Dr. Christine Chamura about the findings of her team's research. But before we be, you know, do that, I'd like to make a few comments about the, the report and, and the research approach that was undertaken to conduct the study. The research was conducted through extensive leadership, uh, I should say extensive literature review. In addition, there were focus groups with regional technology leaders active in this field of big data and analytics, and finally, a survey of business and academic research institutions that took place in the, in the month of February of this year. When you get a copy of the report, you'll see a, a more full explanation of the research uh, methodology uh, in Appendix 2, um, and, and I invite you to, to take a look at that. Uh, the report uh, presents the regional findings, that's, so that's my second point, is the, the regional findings, but also emphasizes the findings that are specific to the Northern Virginia area as well as that within the greater Potomac region. And finally, the research findings that we chose to address um, tried to do a little bit of a deep dive into the seemingly ever elusive definition of big data and the underlying industries that make up the market uh, for, for uh, big data and analytics. And while there was a lot of interesting debate, and believe me, there was a lot on the, the big three Vs, as we call them, volume, variety, and velocity, we chose to emphasize the fourth one, which was around value, and the opportunities that exist around creating value uh, with the data in, in, um, in the markets here. And so we chose to term the, the, the field big data and analytics, looking not only at the collection, but the possibilities that could be realized by analyzing that information. Well, before I steal any more of her thunder, I think it's now time to get to the report. So with that, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Christine Chermura up here to present the, the findings here. Thank you, Greg. Please welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So with that as a backdrop, um, what I'm going to do today first is to uh, give you some background on the sort of the demographics of the big data companies that we um, had respond to our survey. But the bottom line, the outcome of what we had, um, the survey that we got, basically three um, points that I'm going to then emphasize over the remainder of this talk after I give you the demographics. And that is first, as Greg has already said, the nation's data capital is a natural leader in the big data and analytics field. And so it was clear from the survey that we're, we're already a leader in this area and that we could call this um, the data capital. Uh, secondly, um, big data and analytics jobs are expected to be a key driver of economic growth in this region. And uh, that would be particularly important when we're seeing um, the federal government cutting back their spending. Uh, you may recall in the 1980s when we had the cutback in spending and we were worried what would happen in Northern Virginia. And actually, um, in the 1980s, um, this area took off after a couple of years, of course. Now, that's when... Um, then Vice President Gore invented the internet, which of course did help with that. But it could be that big data and analytics and the growth that we're seeing in this field um, could take up some of the slack from the federal government cutbacks that are occurring right now. And then the other thing, especially important, if we have all this demand for big data and analytics, right now what we'll um, show you is that there is a shortage of the type of workers that we need for those firms. The good thing is that education institutions and businesses are teaming together to produce that talent, and that came out of the surveys as well. So with that, um, those three points, I'll be giving you more um, background from the survey of how we got to those three points. And first, though, some of the demographics about the companies that responded. So here you see a map of what we're calling the Greater Potomac Region, and uh, in orange are the Maryland counties uh, that we took into account in that region and also uh, in the uh, sort of butterscotch area there, um, northern Virginia. Each of those dots represents some of the big data and analytics firms that responded um, to the survey. The bigger the dot, the more firms that were concentrated within that zip code. And so no surprise, I don't think, if you can see this um, from the back there, 
is that we have a lot of the larger firms either in the DC area or we have them along um, the Dulles Corridor, which is where we've seen a lot of the high tech firms locating. So again, um, the larger the dot, the more the number of firms there. And as, as long as we continue to have the nation's capital in DC, as long as we don't have a president that's gonna move it to Kansas or someplace else, I think we'll continue to see a lot of innovation uh, with data um, analytics in this region. 270 responded. Uh, we did not give them a definition of big data, so it was um, their self-assessment that they were big data and analytics firms. 72% um, of the respondents uh, were in Northern Virginia of the um, 270 respondents, uh, 162 saying they were big data and analytics. Now just let me give you some quick background on the, the charts that I'll be showing you. Um, what I'm going to show for the most part will be the Potomac region, so the total of that whole region, but then I'm going to break out the Northern Virginia area. And also at the bottom, for those of you who are the, the, more of the scientists, you'll want to know what is the number of respondents for each of these questions. So that's the N equals at the very bottom. So in this particular question, we asked them um, what type of big data and analytics categories would they put their company into. And, they were allowed to choose more than one, so if you were to add some of these up, the percentages are gonna be more than 100%. So the largest percentage said that they were service providers, uh, over 60%. And for the most part, Northern Virginia um, was pretty close to the entire Potomac region. Of course, it's a subset, so you would expect that. 68% of the firms responding in Northern Virginia saying that they were service providers. Software providers, um, almost 30%. Um, hardware providers, much smaller, um, not surprising. I don't think that we would have more of the service providers in this area. And then we also asked them um, how many of them were users. And there you could see 35%. Uh, the survey was also sent to universities and educators. And there you can see um, percentage with um, big data. Um, we asked them how important is big data to the mission of your firm? And we had 50% um, saying that big data and analytics, the revenue, the sales that comes from it um, are critical um, to the mission of our firms. And then 47% saying it was somewhat important and only a small percentage, about 3%, saying that it was not important. So clearly uh, to firms in, in this region, big data and analysis is an important um, piece of what is driving their sales and their growth. Uh, we asked them how large they were in terms of employment. Uh, this was sort of interesting to me. 55% in Northern Virginia and 60% in the Potomac region had 50 or fewer employees. And I think this gives you a sense of the entrepreneurial activity that is going on in the region here. Um, from an economic perspective, uh, typically regions and industries where a lot of entrepreneurial activity is going on tend to grow faster than others. So again, this is just some more underscoring that this is an industry that's evolving and that's growing and that could really support um, Northern Virginia and the Washington area in terms of growth. 7% uh, with 51 to 100 uh, employees. And then at the very top there, only 7% of all the firms that responded had uh, more than 10,000 employees. Uh, we asked them in terms of how long they have been in big data and analytics. And on the right-hand side, first, firms founded less than 10 years ago. A third of them who responded to the survey as big data and analytics um, said that, um, that they were using big data and analytics over the past 10 years. And at the bottom, you can see um, worked in big data and analytics uh, more than five or less than five years. And then on the left-hand side, even the more mature firms, and not surprising, um, um, businesses such as finance um, and medical areas have been using a lot of big data and analytics for, for decades. And so you could see even firms founded 10 years ago, we had some 20% um, or so that said that they have been using big data and analytics since they had been founded. Um, in terms of revenue now, on this slide, we're first showing in the first column, the percentage of their revenue that they're reporting um, that is due to big data and analytics. Then the second column, the number of firms, the percentage of firms, their total employment, um, and then the percentage of sales that are directly related to big data and analytics on average. And then um, 
don't look at the last two columns. I'm going to address them on another slide. Um, but in any case, uh, here on this side, you can see that um, 13 firms said that 100% of their um, revenues came from big data and analytics. And as you go back up on the top there, 76, uh, right above it, 76 to 99% of those firms responding saying that 84% uh, of their uh, revenue is based on big data and analytics type sales. Okay, the nation's uh, data capital is a natural re leader in big data and analytics. And uh, let me show you how we came up to that conclusion based on some of the survey respondents. We asked them how many, uh, how much data, uh, new data on average do they use per day? And here you see the response to it. So 24% in the Potomac region said less than one terabyte. Um, and you can go all the way down uh, the list there, um, seeing how many terabytes of traffic um, are being used up to petabytes. And then here, uh, one third of them said that they analyzed between one um, terabyte and less than one petabyte on an average daily basis. And that's a, that's a lot of data. But to put that into perspective for you, one petabyte is about 250 trillion MP3 downloads from iTunes. So um, hopefully those of you that do a lot of downloading don't do that much per day. But um, if so, you would be equaling some of the firms here in Northern Virginia in terms of the data. What about the sources of the data? In terms of all that data that flows through this region, um, in what um, way are they flowing through or where is the data coming from? I highlighted government or open data at the top. So half of the firms are saying that's where they're getting some of their data. Above that, structured data. So that would be um, point of sale, customer care, supply information. Half of the firms are 60% in the uh, Potomac area saying they're using that. And then coming down below, uh, human generated documents in their um, uh, application form, email um, is what you would include. And then again, about 50% of the respondents saying that's where they got um, their data. And then all the way down, you can see um, audit information was high, machine generated, um, external, uh, demographic, psychographic information. Uh, uh, fourth from the bottom, about almost 40% saying that it was external social data. So that would be Facebook, Twitter. So uh, in this region, a vast um, amount of data flowing th through and coming from many different um, sources. And clearly, government or open um, source data is one important piece of it. 87% um, say they ha have active either internal or external projects. So we ask them, how many active projects do you have right now? And are you doing that work for yourself? Is it internal work, or are you doing it for customers? And so here you see the response to that, with 41% uh, saying they've got one or more active internal projects. And here I'm on the Potomac region. 61% uh, saying one or more active customer projects. So again, both internal and customer um, are important in terms of the, um, the big data and analytics work that's going on in this region. Uh, again, it's clear that proximity to the nation's capital is very important in big data and analytics. And here we ask the question about their subject matter expertise. Uh, where are, what areas does your firm have um, subject matter expertise? Um, government was at the top with 54% of the respondents saying that's where some of their domain expertise was. Intelligence, national security, uh, no surprise, uh, cybersecurity, and healthcare. Um, all very important areas, and again, um, clearly that's because of the nation's capital um, is driving some of that. Um, information technology was also um, the second to the highest on that list, and you could see some of the other areas uh, where uh, the responding firms said that they had uh, domain expertise. Now here's this, um, uh, the slide that I showed you earlier here, but I'm highlighting this time the percent big data and analytics um, sales that are sold to customers in the Potomac region. And so here, total at the bottom, um, for all of the firms, 64% uh, of the sales go to customers within this region. And the hypothesis here is that it's probably the federal government where a lot of those sales are going. And so again, the importance of the capital here, as well as uh, the idea that there are other opportunities uh, from an economic development perspective 
that these firms that are serving the federal government can start to serve um, other firms outside of this area. Okay, big data and analytics jobs are expected to be a key driver of employment growth in this region. So we surveyed all the firms and we asked them what percentage of your workforce is big data, what you would term big data and analytics jobs. And at the very bottom I've highlighted that 11% of the people that work for them, they believe are big data and analytics uh, workers or ha um, have those skills. If we look at firms less than or equal to 10 employees, 70% of those smaller firms would um, classify um, their employees as being big data and analytics. And so you can see as we um, look at the smaller firms that were big data and analytics, a larger percent of them were actually skilled in those areas of big data and analytics. But again, on average, about 11% of all the employees, um, over a million employees, um, are related to big data and analytics according to our responding firms. In terms of growth, um, we asked them to give us their expectations for growth and employment over the next three years. And so here you can see that in Northern Virginia, they expect to add about 12,000 more jobs with 68% of them being big data and analytics occupations or skills. Um, translating that growth rate, translating that number into a growth rate, that would be 3% per year growth in employment to give you a sense of um, how that is relative to all occupations. Uh, the BLS forecasts over the next 10 years all occupations to grow about 1% per year. So big data and analytics occupations growing three times as fast. Um, so that's a considerably um, higher growth rate. Uh, given all that growth, um, educational institutions and businesses are working together to try to either upskill or provide um, students with the skills. Um, this is really important and I applaud um, the region and the universities and the businesses for trying to make sure that the students um, know what's in demand and also that the, um, that the universities are teaching what's in demand. I, I go back to maybe seven or eight years ago and the one uh, curriculum that a lot of universities were adding um, because it was in demand and in demand being in demand by the students was, does anyone want to guess, forensics. And of course, there were some TV shows that might have been driving some of that demand. <laughs> but uh, once we graduated all those students, we found out that we had a surplus of uh, forensic scientists. Um, so this is a case where clearly there is a shortage in this area. And it's good to see that the, the education institutions are stepping up their programs so that we could try to meet that uh, demand. So we asked them, uh, in terms of another question, what type of talent is needed? And they just gave us key words. And so here you can see some of the key words that showed up and we've shown you, we're showing here the frequency of those words showing up. So data, for example, was a word often used or engineer or analyst, software. And again, these are what the businesses are saying um, are the type of talent that we need. So as you go across here, uh, and if you, you have any kids getting ready to go to college, you may want to take some of these keywords home to them, see if you can't influence them. Um, analyst, software, architect, scientist, developer, business. Um, president. president. Yeah, that's, that's one you have to kind of move up to, but um, <laughs> database, manager, director, senior, consultant, and analytics. Okay, then we also asked them to be a little more specific and give us some of the job titles. And here are the job titles that had the most number of people related to them. Uh, business analyst, uh, chief technology officer. Um, we think this was an input error by one of the companies that responded, but we haven't been able to get them um, um, to verify that. So I think this one's an outlier. Um, data scientist. Software um, developer, engineering, data analyst. Again, so here are some of the job titles that are um, most in demand with these companies. Look at that, even economist, although not many, <laughs> but in any case. Um, let, let me go back to that. Um, data visualization, um, and yeah. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. For almost all of the big data and analytic degree programs in the region, 
um, they're falling short of the demand. So how did we come up with this? Um, all of the universities um, provide information on the curriculum. So it's um, curriculum programs um, are collected from, from education statistics. We know how many people graduate with certain degrees. We don't have a big data and analytics degree yet, or at least not one that's um, used by all the universities. So we looked at the areas that would be used in big data and analytics, like statistics or um, engineering, computer engineering. And we looked at all of the degrees that were awarded last year. And then we looked at the demand by the businesses. OK, so we looked at all the businesses in this region and the expectation of their growth, um, and then the occupations that they use. And when we did that, we found out that there are significant shortages in this region for big data and analytics skilled workers. An example would be 1,328 students graduated with a BS or higher in computer and information sciences, but the regional demand is for 3,000 a year. So what that means is that we either have a shortage or we're having to hire those people from outside the region, which increases our cost of hiring. Um, Another example, computer engineering and computer software engineering graduates represent only 10% of the demand that we have in this region. So again, either we're having shortages that's bidding up the wages, or else we're having to bring those people in and recruit them from outside the region. Um, higher education, though, is responding. And in the survey, we found that 70% of the respondent educators in this region either offer right now um, degrees um, in courses that would help people get into big data and analytics, or they're going to do it by 2015. Uh, within five years, 90% um, offer courses and programs. So again, we're seeing the education institutions responding and starting to um, bolster their uh, degree offerings in this area. 62% uh, of the firms provide um, big data and analytic training for employees. So we asked them questions about Right now, how are you getting those skilled workers? Are they coming from internally? Are you upskilling them? Or are you um, training them from outside? So, here, oops, sorry about that. Here you can see 46% um, said that they use both external recruiting to get those skilled workers and upskilling. Only 8% say they upskill alone to get those um, big data and analytics skilled workers. And 45% say that they only use external recruiting alone to get those big data and analytics workers. So you can see firms using a variety of methods to get the skilled workers that they need. And then we also asked them uh, the question, if what area does, do students need to go into or do individuals need to get some skill in order to be um, used in the big data and analytics area? And at the very top, visualization is what came out number one. 50% of the firms in Northern Virginia saying that when these students or when these people come to us, they need to have skills in visualization of big data, taking data and turning it either into maps or turning it into charts and data that will help us make decisions, make better decisions. Um, the second one, algorithms, 40%, big and distributed data skills needed, 50%, and then on down the line, uh, business, uh, temporal statistics, machine learning, about 20% uh, saying that would be needed. We asked the same question of the um, education institutions. And that was interesting because they ranked unstructured data as number one. And down at the bottom, let's see, visualization um, was ranked higher in Northern Virginia, much higher than in the Potomac area. Um, but still not ranked um, consistent with what the business is, but, but fairly close. So big data um, in Northern Virginia and the Potomac region in conclusion then, I think clearly from the uh, survey results that you see here, um, the nation's big data capital, the data capital is a natural leader given the firms that we already have here, the way that they have evolved in terms of their big data and analytics. Um, it's expected to be one of the growth areas, growing three times as fast as employment overall um, in the US. And together, the education institutions, as well as businesses, are working to provide the needs, because right now we see um, some shortages in, that, in this area. Um, so with that, I believe at the break, you'll get a copy of the full report. Um, there are some 
other um, survey questions that I did not address here um, that you can see in that report. So what we're going to do now is just open it up uh, some Q&A for a little brief period, and then we'll take a break. So I'm going to open it up. Uh, there will be microphones around here. Uh, Allison, I know you have one. And... Great. All right. Chris, Dr. Deering. Yes, uh, Dr. Kamara. Uh, one of the sort of surprises, I guess, from the 1980 IT revolution was the amount of individual purchase use. Uh, AOL and everybody else. Um, could you address how that might play out in big data? That is individual use of big data. I know you know airline ticket prices and things have been an issue, and you mentioned Facebook and Twitter. But are there other things that you could allude to? The, the area is just so moving, uh, so new, and so um, not in a sense it's new. I mean the term is somewhat new, but it's been evolving, and there are so much more data and so many more tools to use it. It's hard to even answer that question, but I've got this, uh, I got this thing on my arm. <laughs> it's a uh, um, jawbone. Um, just one example of, you know, a lot of streaming data, a lot of information that uh, now my aunt and uncle are following how much I sleep at night. And, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, I think that there are, it's just um, unlimited um, uses. Uh, uh, Dr. Knapp gave the great examples about um, medicine and indiv individualized medicine. And as we continue to see um, uh, the nanotechnology um, um, and the small, um, uh, being able to get to, to smaller and smaller information, it just overloads the amount of information all of us have. So I, I, I wish I could predict for you better um, and if I could, then I guess we'd all be buying some stock in those areas. But um, I think this area will, will clearly benefit, and will many of the firms here who are already um, in that field will um, will grow and expand because of it. Perfect. Hi. Barbara Rudin with uh, ICF. So can you just say um, how the sample was chosen, the original sample size, and your response rate overall? Okay. Uh, the response rate I don't have off the top of my head, but we started with um, really three areas. One was all the members of the uh, Northern Virginia Technology Council, and that was, I think, at the time, 727, something like that. Um, because of the importance of the federal government here, we thought we should interview um, or send the survey out to um, federal um, contractors. And from there, um, there's something called the CCR. It's a... Uh, anyone who works with the federal government uh, has to fill out um, some points of contact. And fortunately, this was an uh, email-generated um, uh, survey. Um, they also give their email addresses. So we sent it to a, a couple thousand defense and non-defense contractors um, within the region who were not Northern Virginia Technology uh, members. Mm -hmm. So I'm Hao Huang, a professor in computer engineering at GW. So from your report, which is very interesting, we, there's a clear a big gap between what university is doing and teaching and they're doing research on and what the business is cares about. So do you have any suggestions? How can we close this gap? Ali, would that be you? Uh, <laughs> Ali. <laughs> Well, look, one of the things we are doing, of course, here is to create these three institutes, at least in the beginning, that President Knapp mentioned, with the idea that uh, they tend to be multidisciplinary institutes, uh, addressing some, some of the major problems that face us as a nation, actually, in the world. And we are hoping that we will grow educational programs around the work of, of those institutes. But in most cases, you've had... Uh, Programs, educational programs that deal with data analytics or big data have been coming uh, slowly on board. Um, uh, they're either in schools of business, there's some of them are in schools of engineering, some of them are in pro professional schools like College of Professional Studies or schools of professional studies. And those are the, the varieties that you see most of. The ones that 
or in the schools of business, of course, are worried mostly about the business topics. They worry about what corporations want and the businesses would like to get. It's sort of an evolution of the data mining that used to be very popular in the older days. And then engineering schools, as you know, are, are very much uh, geared towards what big data means in terms of engineering. There are issues of, of uh, preserving data, you know, governing data and other, other things, generating data. Uh, I, th I think given the range of, of what this symbolic uh, uh, representation actually uh, uh, entails, there is plenty of room for creating new, perhaps multidisciplinary, cross-disciplinary programs that are very much uh, t targeted to different sectors of the economy. And I think th those opportunities, the sc schools have not really, uh, I think, in my opinion, they haven't really uh, mastered yet. But I, th I think I would, uh, from, uh, from my own perspective, we're trying very hard to actually cover as many fields as we can because the methods are not the same for, I mean, this big data covers a lot of stuff. <laughs> uh, what, what is needed in humanities, for example, or in the life sciences or in the heart, physical sciences are, are totally different. And we, we haven't addressed all of those yet. So one comment I just want to add on to, to Dr. Eskandarian is that, uh, you know, following the creation of the Big Data Task Force by NVTC and, and the study now conducted by Tremure Economics and Analytics, NVTC will actually be setting up a committee which will provide a forum, in fact, for making sure that the dialogue between industry and academic, uh, academia kind of bridge that gap so that the skills that are being developed in the colleges and universities are, in fact, uh, picked up by the, by the businesses and meet their needs. The second thing I, I just want to say is you're going to probably get a little more color and Q&A in each of the two panels that follow this where I'm sure that question will be addressed to by those panels. So I just want to point that. Other questions? One question here. Uh, it may sound a very stupid question. What is the definition of data and what is the mechanism of collecting it? You want to take a shot at that? Uh, this, this reminds me of the debate you that mean ensued in the ta uh, but while we were constructing the survey instrument. Right. Did you mean data or data? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Stephanie Ship with the Social and Decisions. Oh, God. Oh, I like oh, this. I'm still thinking. Okay. I, I, okay. We have a... Somebody's taking a shot. Well, we had a question that's being answered. I'm sorry. Uh, Gil Miller with Nobles. So I, I'll shift the, the, um, uh, the, the, the question a little bit, do the classic uh, presidential thing of when you get answer, ask the question that you don't want to answer, you just uh, pivot a bit. But um, so uh, we, we had a quick uh, discussion, uh, a comment about the three Vs, four Vs, eight Vs, whatever Vs, how many Vs you want to do. Um, and, and so a lot of people are always trying to quantify things of how many petabytes, how many this, how many that, zettabytes, or whatever, or what it is about. Um, I, I, one of the things that we had, one of the focus question, uh, sessions that we had from um, uh, Chris and her group was exactly that question of what is it? And I, I thought that uh, the, the best thing that, we, that several of us put on the table was, so big data represents a uh, problem that is no longer, uh, that cannot be addressed by traditional approaches and requires new, dare I say, radically new approaches to how we're going to handle this stuff. And um, I, I think that um, uh, that probably serves us rather well because the numbers will always be escalating, um, either whether we're talking about volume, velocity, whatever, uh, those numbers will be increasing. But what is really fundamental here is that we need new approaches, the standard uh, be they relational databases or whatever, the, the standard and, and computing models, they will not work. We need to invest uh, and figure out and innovate around what are the new solutions. Okay. Uh, that, I agree with that definition. I think it's a great one in thinking about data that are collected for other purposes and then being reused and combined with traditional sources of data. But the point I wanted to make, and what I was disappointed not to hear out of the survey, is the role of statistics. And I think that the second person alluded to that with asking about sample size of actually just this survey. 
Um, I'd like to hear about what the role of statistics is at the three new institutes at GW and highlight the role of that training across the board because just because the data are big does not mean they're necessarily useful. Just because the data are big doesn't mean that they're representative or that you can use them to draw conclusions. And we saw this with the Google Trends recently in an article in Science in uh, the April issue. So um, Hal Varian said that the next sexiest or the sexiest profession alive are the statisticians. So I was surprised not to see them listed only yeah. once as temporal, temporal statisticians up there. And I do want to encourage businesses in the art of statistical thinking and not underplay that at all here. Yes, yeah, statistics, statistics did show up a lot, and maybe just not in that degree as a pure statistics degree, but statistics clearly important in a lot of the degrees that are being used for data. Uh, one of our um, big data and analytics, one of our focus group members said um, the difference between a statistician and a, um, gosh, I've lost it now. A data scientist is that the data scientist gets paid more, basically. <laughs> but it's, it's the same thing. So yes, that, there was a lot of discussion around that, but good comment. Thank you. Yes. yes. All right. We're going to take one more question. But before that, I just want to also say that I invite you to the, to the panel uh, that Dr. Chalupa will be moderating, in which uh, I think the that you're going to see that uh, particular topic uh, addressed. So, Chris. One last question. Chris, can I uh, ask the question? Have you looked at any of the That's other questions. regions, and have they done similar uh, inventories, and how do we compare, or, or how do even our methodologies compare? Yeah. Um, so this was another big debate among the, the group, the focus group. Um, should we use something that economists use called North American Industry Classification Codes? And there really is no NAICS code, is what it's called, that represents big data and analytics. And we would have to take percentages, and, we, and that would be the only way that we could really compare our re Northern Virginia here and the Potomac region to other regions or Virginia and other states. Um, so that's why we took the survey. So we took the survey up approach. But um, the only other region that I know of is the Massachusetts um, Technology Region, um, and they did a survey and they also spoke to businesses. But what they did not do is um, include users in their survey. Um, I believe our numbers were larger, but they're, again, they're not apples and apples. Um, they did a survey maybe about a year ago, and then they just came out with one, another one, uh, uh, maybe two or three weeks ago. Tony? In, in terms of the, the Commonwealth, we're focusing on big data and open yeah. data. And one of the things I think that is not necessarily addressed a lot is the culture adoption. Because you know we've always been trained to protect data, and you know to a certain degree maybe over classification of data, and the whole thing to drive this momentum and value with the three V's is the variety aspect and being able to share data in the right way in terms of you know protecting data, making sure data is protected, but also be able to have uh, you know the the right mechanisms to share data in order to drive value. And I think that you know, it would be great for the committee. And the question is, have you been looking at that in terms of sharing between governments, uh, you know, in terms of data, or data sets, uh, combinations between government, commercial, and other entities like nonprofits? You know, I think right. You know, I would say that there is a lot of that experimentation going on. I, I know the government is undertaking. Um, you know, through a, d a number of different contracts, the exploration of how to do some of that ex uh, that uh, that sharing of data uh, and and the uh, analytics around it, but I also say think that the university research uh, initiatives are also exploring that that avenue as well. And I know, uh, Dr. Crandall, you probably address maybe a little of that in your 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 panel breakout. So.